Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie O'Leary. And we have a football-specific podcast for you guys. Uh, we've had a few people in the comments talking about where the football program is at right now. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a spring practice preview. Go over some of the storylines we're looking to watch, some of the players we think uh, we should keep an eye on, all that kind of stuff. We're going to have everything covered. Practice starts tomorrow. Richie will go into when we're going to hear from certain coaches and players. Exciting time for Rutgers football. But first, our presenting sponsor is Night and Day Apparel. Calling all Rutgers students, alumni, and fans. Are you looking for new and unique Rutgers merchandise? Night and Day Apparel has you covered. From t-shirts to hoodies, drinkware to pet accessories, Night and Day focuses on providing the Rutgers community with exclusive one-of-a-kind tailgating products. Be sure to check out the links in today's podcast description to to our website and social media so you can stay up on top of everything Night and Day including new merch drops and promotional announcements. Shop now and keep chopping. Uh, Personally, just because it's right. <laughs> yeah. But the whole like thank you bag type thing on the back, like that that's pretty cool. That like, is pretty sick. It's pretty neat. That, and that shirt is available on night and day along with a few other uh, KTR shirts and just all sorts of cool stuff. So yep. if you haven't been there already, definitely check it out. It's a great place to get Rutgers gear. Uh, we've also got another sponsor, the Cut App. Uh, I love betting, betting on everything, even though I didn't hit my bet on the cut app this weekend. Uh, I bet on the NCAA tournament, but you can bet on really anything with your friends. It's a peer-to-peer social betting platform that's legal in 40-plus states. It has customizable odds, tracking capabilities, and an entire social network of group chats, user profiles, and rewards. All the payments are made through the app. You don't need Venmo to square everything up. Um, if you use our promo code BELIEVERUTKERS, that's B-L-E-A-V, Rutgers, you get a 10% welcome bonus. Don't forget to use that code when you sign up. Cut, put your money where your mouth is. All right, so we have a couple news items before we get into the spring preview. First off, we had a medical retirement announced today. Jacob Allen, the former number one recruit in the state of New Jersey, uh, who had suffered a kind of a series of, of knee injuries before he really ever had a chance to get on the field at Rutgers, announced he is medically retiring. This is one that we've kind of put out there and kind of illustrated mm-hmm. for everybody, but... Uh, Jacob Allen is no longer going to be playing football at Rutgers. Um, just talk about that injury situation, and, and are you surprised by it at all? No, I'm not surprised. Um, he, I mean, the guy hasn't seen the field since he's he's been at Rutgers, number one. Number two, we hinted at it last year on our message boards about how uh, if you watched or looked at the photo that we posted, um, or he posted, I should say, we screenshot it and then shared it on our message boards. His knee was destroyed. I, I, like, I have bad knees. I've had three knee surgeries myself, but his has like a scar that's like a foot long between yep hip or not hip to between thigh to calf like it was insane looking um if you read up on the story um by chris eisman that came out today it, he's just had just everything go wrong i think it was five surgeries in total he had another one this past december we were told so it's just it was a long road for him to even make an attempt to come back um so yeah it's not too shocking it does suck because that's the second out of the what seven linemen in that class if you count the transfers or third yeah. i guess because i think Willie tyler was in that class um if you count transfers but um there was five total i believe they brought in out of those five total six total, six total i don't know i forget regardless um that's the second one to medically retire the rest haven't been like too great you haven't really seen a whole lot of them and that was supposed to be like a star studded offensive line class that was coming in for Rutgers. so a little concerning but uh it is what it is um it definitely hurts but uh end of the day the scholarships are at 91 right now. You need to get down to 85 before um, game one, kickoff of game one, August 31st, 30, September 1st. I don't know, whatever it is. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, they were going to have to remove some scholarships somewhere, so this opens it up. The nice thing is, like Monegro, he's also going to stay with the program. Now, Monegro's helping out uh, as a grad assistant or an assistant or some student assistant, something like that. Whereas Allen's going to actually help out with the strength and conditioning room, which was a little interesting to me, considering uh, he is kind of a uh, a big power lifter guy. Yeah, it's cool when these guys can find a way to stay as really a part of the team and around the team, even if they can't play anymore. So be cool if he he does stick around. And a lot of these guys stay in these industries, whether they become trainers or you know they you know stay and do football camps, things like that. Uh, they they stay active with with uh, the sport in general. So good to hear on that. Yeah. So, um, cool. Additionally, we have a name who's a bit of a blast from the past. He's a guy who was in contention for one of the two open defensive back coaching spots the last couple cycles. Yeah. 
That's former Rutgers cornerback David Rowe. He's a guy who Shiano really wanted to fill one of those roles. He offered him one of the jobs. Mm-hmm. David Rowe actually turned him down. He was working for Dana Holgerson down at uh, Houston. That staff got let go this offseason, and he ended up back at Rutgers. So tell us a little, little bit about how David Rowe ended up back here. Yeah, so David Rowe's been, um, from what I've been told, he's been talking to Rutgers a little bit ever since because they've had multiple DB openings between Fran Brown before he got hired. Obviously, that was a quick one. Uh, when he left for Georgia, there was two openings, technically, between corners and safeties. He was intrigued by it, but he really didn't want to leave Houston. But he was going to, and I think this was prior to the 2021 season, I think it was. And that's when he was just the cornerbacks coach for Houston. He ended up getting his promotion to secondary, which was a pay bump. You get to stay in Texas. You get to stay with your team, blah, 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 all that other good stuff. So he ended up staying. Uh, they went after Orphy. They got Lascari. Great. I think Orphy's been a stud. So this is this really good hire for Rutgers in general. But uh, now he comes back to Rutgers. Uh, he's a Cocoa. Cocoa? Cocoa? I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's just Cocoa. Cocoa, Cocoa. Beach. Cocoa, yeah. Florida. Cocoa Beach, Florida, whatever. Um, a high school that produces a ton of talent. Um, he gets reunited with Greg Shiano, who he's not only played under but coached under down at tampa bay as well um and he's got connections now so he's been to western michigan and, and um central michigan so he has some michigan ties he's been obviously a florida guy he's got some florida ties he's been down in texas for a couple years now he's got some texas ties now so this is a guy that i think eventually maybe even as early as next year could be one of the defensive back coaches um because we hear orphy's name every off season we heard it again this off season it's not a coincidence the past two off seasons he's gotten a contract extension both times so um between old miss between miami for those that are curious there was a couple others that were reaching out to him i think mississippi state was interested in orphy Rutgers has shown they're not uh, afraid to pay up uh, for these guys and it's a good sign but eventually he is going to leave for a job and that's that's also a good sign too because coaches move up in the world when they move up it's great for Rutgers, great for everyone and now you have a guy like a scott valone waiting in the wings and ready to go as soon as uh that does happen yeah, Shiano definitely likes having in-house replacements when possible, so it's great to get Dave, uh, David Rowe back on campus as a he's an analyst, a defensive analyst for the yep. team. Um, he doesn't have an, an official coaching title, but he'll be in the rooms, he'll be you know providing his expertise, so mm-hmm. great to have another talented coach at Rutgers. Um, before we, we, we got some storylines to watch for spring practice, but before we dive into that, uh, you were kind of given the breakdown of how things would be structured for spring practice and you know who would be available when. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about when we can expect to hear from different players and coaches and then kind of where uh, different the scrimmages lie on the schedule. So there's not going to be – let's just start from the beginning. Tomorrow's first day. Uh, we're going to get to talk to Greg, of course, as always. Um, I think we get to talk to Greg usually one or two times per week. It really depends. If it's a scrimmage, it's two times. If it's not a scrimmage, it's probably just once. Um, so as as per usual, we're going to talk to Greg originally. And then um, we're going to get to talk to the quarterback, it sounds like. Um, there's going to be just the two. It's going to be a normal interview process, nothing crazy. Uh, no video, but we will have interviews afterwards written up for everybody. It will be video of Greg's press conference. But um, it sounds like we're going to talk to Ethan and Gavin, which kind of tells you where things lie right now. I know everyone's kind of holding out hope a little bit, like, oh, my God, AJ, you could be the savior. And it's like, no, dude, like, it's going to be one of the veterans. Everyone knows it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I expect to hear very basic stuff from both of them. It's nothing nothing crazy. They're media trained by now. They're all, but they're both in, what, year three, four, whatever it is. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't expect much out of them. But uh, Thursday, we will get Kirk Shiraka. Also, we'll get to talk to Nassim Brantley. So that's going to be intriguing to see. Um, the inner workings of what happened with the NCAA thing, how much of the process was just like telling the NCAA to F off, like <laughs> figure it out. Um, so we'll, we'll probably learn a little bit more about that. I don't know how open he will be or can be about the process because it is like a little weird situation. Um, so we'll get to talk to him, Shiraka, and then Saturday it's going to be Harris Simiak. Um, and I'm assuming one of the linebackers, uh, if I had to guess, because it's usually you get a position player with the position coach so now that he's with the linebackers it makes a lot of sense no scrimmage this week um it's only week one that's normal or anyone freaks out probably gonna be spider pads for week one the entire week one i should say week two they'll probably throw on the full pads and then you'll get a scrimmage next saturday not this Sunday, saturday next saturday um so yeah it's gonna it's gonna move fast it's gonna go quick and uh the spring game will be here before you know it 
Yeah, the spring game is a little over a month from today. Uh, it's Saturday, April 27th. So uh, it's the same mm-hmm. day as Rutgers Day. So it's a great day in general to get on campus if you uh, have an open weekend at the end of April. But yep. um, it's I thought it was interesting they're going to give you guys both uh, likely starting quarterback i see both likely the the two main competitors for the starting quarterback role basically the first day players are available just kind of get that out of the way Mm -hmm. um so it'll be interesting to hear what both of them say because ethan calic manis has kind of been like the uh the incognito mode guy since he got to ruckers i don't think he's got a huge social media presence they don't even tag him on the ruckers football post which i think is interesting he's like one of the only people who don't get tagged um, and maybe for better with some of the pictures they've taken of him, there's yeah. one in particular where he's lifting, he's doing like a, yeah. an overhead pull down and he's just got this like really goofy looking mm-hmm. face. So, um, but it'll be interesting to hear from him. Uh, and that's kind of leads us directly into our, our set of topics here. These are the storylines that yeah. we are most excited to, to follow and watch during spring practice. Um, I think the first is kind of evident every single Rutgers football fan is going to be talking about this topic all off season until they name a starter and probably yep. well after they name one quarterback battle. Yep. So he obviously brought in Athian Kaliak Menace in the off season. He transferred in from Minnesota. Uh, the mm-hmm. incumbent starter, Gavin, uh, I almost said nope. another Gavin, but Gavin, oh, Gavin. Wimsat uh, is uh, the incumbent starter who led Rutgers to its first bowl win in almost a decade mm-hmm. last year. Uh, you have true freshman AJ Serres, who's coming in as an early enrollee as, as a high schooler. And then you have last year's freshman, Johnny Shepard, who's a redshirt mm-hmm. freshman. Um, what are you most excited to see out of this quarterback group? I want to see if one of them can actually grab the job by the reins. And actually, I know it's cliche because we say it every year, but I want to see someone actually grab the job and run away with it. I don't want to see any close battles. I don't want to see like, you know, Evan, Sam- Evan Simon's having some pretty good practices, but Gavin's just like a step better. Like, mm, But then Evan Simon has a better practice. No, I need to see consistency out of the quarterback position. I need to see someone that can just grab the job and run away with it. Um, and I, I think, honestly, Ethan's probably going to do that, if I had to guess. Um, <clears throat> there's a reason they're giving him to us tomorrow, because he has a legitimate shot. He didn't get brought in to become a backup. Almost every transfer that gets brought in, no matter what the sport is, is not a backup. Now, there's some cases, don't get me wrong, but like for the most part, especially when the quarterback room is the way it is, it's, it was the, it's just like basketball, actually. Um, they had the lowest effective field goal percentage player in basketball. They had the lowest um, completion percentage player in football. It's just time to move on, time to replace. And I think Ethan is going to be that guy. Um, I don't have a, a horse in this race. Like, I don't care who wins either way. I just want to see Rutgers play better. <laughs> That's it. Um, now, this is where it's going to be intriguing because we've already heard some rave reviews about AJ Serace. Now, he's, he's coming in. He probably has a pretty good build for college already because he is this legitimate 6'2", 2'10", probably 215-ish. We'll get the official roster numbers tomorrow. But um, I've, I've heard really good things about him already. And it wouldn't shock me if he was the starter by the end of the season if things don't go to plan. Um, I think AJ is the future. I think he's a multi-year starter. It's going to be really intriguing to see, number one, if someone can run away with this battle. Number two, what happens if they start struggling in the season? Do you go to the young kid, the young buck, and say, you know what, we already got our six wins. Let's try to see if we can get this young buck a little bit uh, matured for next season or the end of this season or even so it's going to be really intriguing to see how it works out yeah i mean last year there was no discussion whatsoever <clears throat> despite however gavin played uh shiano didn't even really seem to give a thought to changing quarterbacks nope. i wonder if he sticks with that kind of mindset this year now that he has some better options available to him because i i I don't think it's a stretch to say this is the best quarterback room Rutgers has had in probably a decade in terms of the collection of talent they have. Um, If you had to handicap it as we sit today, give your percent chance of each guy starting. I'll start with Johnny Shepard. What percentage do you have on him starting game one of the 2024 football season? I hate saying never, but it's it's a zero. Like he's not he's not going to be the starter. Um, I, I've seen a Johnny a bunch of times between high school, between college. I think he's a great kid. I just don't think he's a power five level quarterback, to be honest with you. Now, as a third quarterback, at this even moment. fourth, like that's fine. That's great. Yeah. Like that's that's great for the quarterback room. Like you said, it's deep, so it gives you a little bit of depth. He had some little game run last year. I forget if it was like Howard or Virginia Tech or someone. Oh, not Howard. Yep, um, 
whoever it was. It was one of the. It was the, the FCS opponent. Yeah. Yeah, for, I can't remember about that. Um, besides the point. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with zero on that one. All right, let's go with the the young buck, the the, the fr- true freshman AJ Sarays. What percent chance do you have him starting game one of the 2024 season? I'm actually going to go a little higher than I think people think, or maybe not, but I'm going to say 15%. I think there's a slight, slight chance that he could come in guns blazing because he's accurate, he's mobile, he can throw on the run. He doesn't really need to, of course, you need to turn some of that body weight into muscle, but he's already got some really good size. He's really accurate on the run. This kid I've seen not only in camp, like perform at the high level, at the highest of high levels, the lead 11, he looked phenomenal in state college. I'd argue he was probably the best quarterback of the group, but of course it's in state college, so they're going to, hey, Here's 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 the Penn State commit. Give him the the invite. I would have given both of them the invite if I could have, because I think that kid's pretty good too. But um, I think AJ's a really good quarterback. Um, it's tough because the competition he faced in high school wasn't the best, but he did play a good St. Francis team. We beat them, so I mean, like he's he's gonna be very impressive down the line. Maybe not this year. I think twenty twenty five could set up for a really intriguing battle between a redshirt freshman and him and maybe a, a senior, a redshirt senior in either of uh, Gavin or Ethan. Interesting. That's higher than I thought you'd say, but uh, file that one away. Let's go with the incumbent, or let's go with the new guy, Ethan Kaliak Manis. What percent chance do you have him starting game one for Rutgers this season? I'm going to go, uh, if, if I did my math right, 60% here. Okay. I think there's a 60% chance, so that would be, what, 75? And then yep. 20, yeah. So. so 25 for Gavin, 60% for, for Ethan. Just mm-hmm. kind of for everyone listening, break down why that gap is so big for you. Gavin's been here for what? It's going to be, he's a redshirt junior, so I'll be year four, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like Mine, three and a half. Yeah, you know? I know he showed up in September. People don't like to count that year. He was with the program for not camp, but for the season. So it is what yeah. it is. Whatever. Um, he just hasn't improved his accuracy. And it drives me nuts. Like, he's the most inaccurate quarterback in all of college football. He had a much better offensive line last year, so there's really no excuse. We've seen so many balls where he can throw an accurate dart one, one minute, and then he throws the next three over the guy's head. We saw it in a pinstripe bowl. It's not even like it got better during the season. Throughout the year, it, it actually got worse, I feel like, at times. Like, pinstripe bowl, he overthrew a – who the hell was the tight end? Jeez. Uh, Sean Bauman. I forgot about him already. Um, but he yeah. overthrew Sean Bauman. Like, and it's not like it's like, hey, his hands are here. The ball's right here. The ball's like 10 feet above his head. Like, yeah. either you have accuracy or you don't. And I know it's an old Mike Leach thing, but like, that's the truth. Like, you, you're either born with it or you're not. Like, it's, yeah, his, it's, his big thing was you're either the kid who could uh, stand 50 a, feet away from the stop sign and hit, a yeah. snow, hit, a, uh, hit the stop sign with the snowball or you weren't that kid. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it is kind of an inherent thing it's like speed where you're you know you can make progression around the edges on in terms of uh gaining more speed but in terms of becoming fast through training it's not really possible same way with with accuracy Uh, and and on top of it the kid they're bringing in ethan is not like in some random quarterback where he's got to learn the whole new system this system has been taught to him already like he knows it through and through um, and he's more mobile than people give him credit for. They're like, yeah, well, Gavin's mobile. He's got the mobility. He ran for, what, five, 600 yards. This kid's a lot more mobile than you think, and he's built like a tank. Like, I know Gavin yeah. might have more weight to him, it says, at least per the roster numbers from uh, this year and last year. But Ethan is a big dude, and he's, he's bulky, and he's, he's not afraid to, like, run you over. So I, I really think Ethan is the better quarterback. I think he had a worse offensive line last year and still put up better numbers. So that goes to show you if you get him with a better offensive line, you got Pat Flaherty year two now. That line should be just as good, if not better, you would think. They are missing some pieces, but I still think Ethan runs away with this job. And there's a reason they brought in a guy that has connections to Kurt. So. Yeah, totally makes sense. And I, I, it'll, it'll be something that will be much discussed all, all off season. So we'll save some of that meat on the bone there. Yep. Give me another area of the team that you're really intrigued or excited to watch this spring. Um, I'd say wide receiver really intrigues me because I know there's two that are like pretty much slotted in as starters, and that's Dimir Miller, the transfer top FCS receiver, set records at Mama at at one spot. Christian Dremel has proven more than his worth last year. Um, he was arguably the best receiver last year among the group. Um, I know he had the most targets, but uh, I'd say he was probably the best among that entire group last season. And between those two, it's their starters after that is where it gets really interesting 
that wide receiver, that other wide receiver spot, you have Nassim Brantley, who's what six year guy, seventh year guy, if you don't count last season. I don't do you count last season? How's that work? Um, but he's now eligible. He's put up good numbers at Western Illinois. Chris Long, who was a projected starter before he got hurt in the Northwestern game. I think he actually might have started that game, if I recall correctly, and then just got dinged up a little bit midway through, something like that. Missed a season. He's coming back from injury, so you might not see a lot of him this spring, but he's going to compete for that job. And then Ian Strong. Ian Strong shown some really good skills. Um, came in as a DB, moved to wide receiver, shown off some really good hands. Um, so I'm kind of intrigued to see how this plays out for that other wide receiver spot. I think it's a true legitimate battle between a veteran, a veteran, and a second-year player who's probably got the highest upside of the three. So that's where it's going to be really intriguing. And they all present different skill sets too. Like Brantley's, I shouldn't even say different skill sets, different sizes, because Brantley and Strong are 6'3", 210, 6'2", 205. Whereas Chris Long is a little bit smaller at 6'175". But Chris Long is a little more elusive in my opinion. Well, he was before the injury. So we'll see if he can get that back. But that wide receiver room is going to be super interesting. And then Dremel's backup it's everyone thinks still in Braithwaite's going to just sneak that job. I'm keeping an eye out for Benjamin Black. That kid was phenomenal yeah. in high school. Speedster, fast. I wouldn't be shocked if he sees the field this year just because he's that good. So it's it's going to be something to watch. Yeah, and you didn't even mention the highest rated guy in the whole entire uh, That's war, thing. So AJ many. Duff. He's a yeah. true freshman coming in. Uh, he's very hyped. He was the number one player in the state of New York last year. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a guy who... It's it's going to be tough to keep them off the field. It'll be interesting to see uh, the cream rise to the top in this group because it is, I know we just talked about the the quarterback room being probably the most uh, talent rich it's been in a decade. I'd say the receiver room is right up there as well. This is a very talented group and who actually emerges from it will be very intriguing for sure. So the, the other most interesting thing, and I've mentioned this to you off the pod, but so if you, you follow them on social media, you follow the players, they always post stuff. Dave Brock took the wide receiver room out to dinner last night. Monday night? Sunday night? Sunday night. Um, among that group, I, I always look at the photos. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, there's there's Miller. There's Braithwaite, blah, blah, blah. Is that Thomas Amakwa? I'm like, wait, oh. Hmm. So Thomas Amakwa eating with the wide receiver room. So if it happens, if the switch does happen, he's a very good wide receiver out of high school. Where do you spot this guy? I <laughs> think you have so many receivers. Like, I don't know what you do. I feel like you almost have to move someone to corners for the sole fact that you don't have many corners like it's going to be really intriguing to see how this all plays out because like Davon Fuse moved over from linebacker last year was that out of necessity was that out of the fact that he was just a good athlete like I, I really don't know Isaiah Crumpler could probably play some linebacker from Toure I think would be a stud at linebacker but I also think he could be a stud at wide receiver too he's shown some glimpses last year Ophiri missed the beginning of the season and he was dinged up, but when he was healthy, he started playing some snaps. This this room is very, very deep, but it's going to be hard to pick just three guys um, every play or every snap. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, just It's a champagne problem to have is you got too many good uh, prospects in the room. Um, what, another uh, area I'm really kind of excited and intrigued by is the right side of the offensive line. Uh, we lost a starter at guard in uh, Curtis Dunlap. Um, yeah. On the right side, also, you know, we had a guy in Reggie Sutton who didn't play most of the last, what, three years? Yeah. And then he came on midway through last year and was a bit of a revelation. He played really well for a guy who hadn't played football in like almost three years. Uh, Tyler Needham went down with a season ending injury, I think, against Temple. So seeing them battle it out, I mean, at worst, you have quality depth there, which is never a problem, uh, never a bad thing. Um, then all the development of the younger guys along the offensive line, like you said, we have how many offensive linemen with a uh, freshman or sophomore eligibility? Like six, seven, at least eight, scholarship nine, guys. 10, 11, 12 right now. It was 13 before Allen. Yeah. So 12 guys on scholarship along the offensive line with sophomore or freshman eligibility. So how those guys shake out, usually there's one or two that really start to kind of show something around this time in their careers. Not yeah. everyone's going to make it. Uh, not everyone's going to work out, but th- those who do tend to uh, make an impact around this time. Yeah, um, it's it's going to be interesting because, like you said, Sutton missed, what, three, almost three years? So it was like 600, 700 days almost, I think it was, uh, from snap to snap. Um, so is his body going to hold up for another season? Like, this man's knee, like legs are just really bad. Like, they're not good. 
Um, like, can he hold up a full year starting two years in a row? I don't know. It's a lot of pressure on him. You kind of need him, though, based on the just looking at the team. Um, Felter was a guy who wasn't a starter going into the last season, wasn't even like really a rotation piece. I guess he was towards the middle. Became a full-fledged starter, so he's probably penciled in. Pierce is penciled in. Zelensky is penciled in. It's that right side, that right guard and right tackle. Could Sutton step up and be right tackle or right guard, I mean? I think he could. Um, but is he athletic enough to play that guard spot? That's where it gets tricky because you need a guy that can actually – you can pull once in a while. You can move him around a little bit. Someone with like some legitimate athleticism and with his legs and his issues, I don't know if I can put him there and trust him for a whole entire year. Uh, like you said, Needham's out for the year. Dominic Rivera has shown some flashes at tackle, so maybe he could be your right tackle potentially. He's got good size, great kid. Uh, Taj White's shown some flashes. Dante Chin has been showing some flashes. Asamo has even seen some time at guard. So you have some pieces to work with. I don't think any of them are like, wow, like they have a surefire Holland Pierce at right guard or right tackle. But um, it's going to be interesting. I still think you need a transfer, man. I, I can't stress that enough. It's hard to get them, but you need that. It's, it's, that's a great point. That's kind of one of the things I wanted to bring up too is, you know, how they choose to use the portal in this second window when it opens up. Mm-hmm. Um, because that is uh, something that they haven't really, it doesn't, they, they, they haven't made a whole lot of noise in the portal the last, mm-hmm. um, you know, few weeks to few months because it has, you know, it's been closed. Mm-hmm. Um so how they go in and kind of patch additional holes, I think will be very intriguing. Oh, tight end specifically. Yeah. You need a tight end. <laughs> I know they don't use them really, but you need someone. Like, it's crazy to me. But we'll see. Um, is there any other additional position groups that you're interested in seeing this spring? Or is that kind of the, the main, do we hit on the main ones for you? Uh, I'd say the only other one I'm keeping a close eye on is defensive tackle. Can um, Keontae Hamilton step up and be that guy? Can Renee Conga put on some weight and take over that defensive tackle spot? Because he's good when he was playing, and he's already at 290. So, I mean, if you put him on 10 more pounds, 300, I, I can't really see them putting a 300-pound guy on the outside. Um, but he did, he did rotate in as a defensive end at times. Uh, Malcolm Ray, is this guy going to fill the void that they kind of just fill every year with a, ta- or a transfer? Can he be better than, um, say, Isaiah Eaton, who had his moments? I don't think he was great. I don't think he was bad. Can he step up and take that step to the next level for that defensive tackle spot? Um, maybe. Zaire Angoy made some noise last year. Troy Rainey's probably going to be up there somewhere, too. Um, I'm just intrigued to see how they rotate those guys. I know Malcolm Ray's probably penciled in as a starter. That other spot's really wide open between Hamilton and Conga, Rainey, Angoy. Like, you think... If Rainey didn't really play that much last year, you'd think he wouldn't be up there. But like they, they really don't have many, uh, many guys with experience at defensive tackle. Yeah, I agree. It'll be interesting to see if anybody really shines in terms of a young player developing, or to see how a guy who's experienced and coming in for the first time at Rutgers, like a Malcolm Ray, kind of either looks, you know, head and shoulders above, or looks like you know just another mm-hmm. guy. These, uh, these early impressions tend to be pretty powerful. So. Be interesting to see that for sure. Yeah. Um, but in general, it's an exciting time. Uh, Rutgers football is kicking off uh, the first step in what should be a pretty um, monumental season for the football program. This is the first season I can remember in a long time where there are legitimate expectations, and I feel pretty good about them uh, hitting those 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 expectations as well. Uh, yeah. There is going to be a basketball specific pod coming out. Um, either mm-hmm. later today or tomorrow, uh, because we're hearing a few news items. And if you're following along online, you might know what we're talking about. Maybe you don't, but... Uh, Do the Caymans, baby! <laughs> yeah, there's 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 a lot of news that we want to kind of separate these two podcasts out into separate ones entirely. So yeah, stay tuned I, to your podcast you feed. I plan for the beach one. Yep. We're, in addition, we're going to be speaking with Rutgers Athletic Director Pat Hobbs tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be asking them all sorts of different questions, uh, which uh, you can, there's a, going to be a thread on the board today if you want to ask mm-hmm. anything specific. But uh, the video of, of Pat uh, calling out Rutgers NIL and pledging or getting people to, to support it couldn't have come at a better time for us because we'll actually yes. get to talk to him about it directly tomorrow. Um, 
But for me and Richie, this has been another edition of the Night Report Podcast, signing off.